Welcome to Policing TV in this edition of Talking Crime with me, Danny Shaw. I'm at the World Police Summit in Dubai and as you can see here from the exhibition area, technology is one of the key features of this summit. And one man who's been talking about technology and its role in policing is James Raymer, the Chief of Toronto Police in Canada. And I've been asking him about the key themes and messages that he's been putting across. I think from my perspective and, and from in, in Toronto, we're, we're looking at technology as, a, as products, individual products. And when you, you break it down to, say, your 911 emergency response, investigative in victim services, traffic enforcement. And so when we look at technology, we're trying to identify uh, technology that will provide across the board flexible capability so that you have wins that are that multiply and are reinforced and and when I, I when i say that i use the example of body worn camera uh, and cell phones uh, we now give individual officers cell phones uh, when they're when they're out on the road and and so you can take video you can seize digital evidence you can take statements and and then that work is automatically prepped for court purposes you have automatic translation so that's really freeing up the officer to be out on the road and away from the paperwork. That's really advancing, making a better police product. And I think that's where we're trying to focus our attention because you're limited by your budgets and, and your, your employers want to see the benefits from that investment in technology. And we're seeing it in that way. And, and I think the, the additional benefit, of course, when you look at body-worn camera, it, it's improving accountability. Uh, it's it's saving the police officer from a false allegation, uh, but it's like I say, it's creating more accountability in the police, more professionalism. That's a better police product. So, in terms of technology, what next? Are we looking, for example, at facial recognition, at using algorithms, artificial intelligence, as a way of increasing powers of surveillance or detection? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the future is algorithmic policing. You know, you look at facial technology surveillance cameras, um, there, there's so much possibility there. But right now, and I, I think more so perhaps in North America, certainly in Canada and in, in Toronto, the public is cautious. They're afraid of it. And quite often they think our capability is much more than what it truly is. Much of that probably influenced by television. But they're, they're, they're afraid of what it might be. So that's caused us to now talk more openly about technology you know what are the limits of technology in terms of our scope of use be much more transparent about it and 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 to really you know enhance that public trust and confidence so they'll support our investment in the technology and so that's really where we're working so it's really about project management product management and transparency for us now do you think the public are right to be cautious about about ai uh, facial recognition systems yeah, I, I think they are, and, and, and that's, that's been our mantra right now as an organization, to proceed cautiously. Uh, we're using facial recognition in a very limited way. What, which ways? Well, what it is, is we have, as a result of the identification of criminals acts when, in Canada, when you arrest someone, you can take their fingerprints and photographs. Well, that is the only database that we will use for photographs. Okay, and then the only way we will access that database for facial recognition is because of a criminal offense, a legitimate criminal offense. And so if you seize video at the scene, uh, or you get pictures of somehow at the scene, we will then access that database, and it's only through a specialized unit and special trained people, so it's not, you don't have access throughout the organization to use it. So we use it in a very limited and specific capacity, and we report on it that way. And so the public, uh, are content with our use that way. Much broader use of it as it, as it is in other u countries, they are not prepared to do that here in Canada. And uh, But I think, you know, it's like anything, over time, as they begin to understand it, as they begin to see the value of it, we get better support for it. And if I can, I'll just say, like, even when we introduce drones, we introduced drones, you know, about five years ago, I'd say now, and when we did, we, were, we in indicated we were only using it for you know, to search for people that were missing, um, you know, and very, uh, very, you know, to take pictures at traffic scenes so that we could open up the highway sooner. Uh, very limited use, but now 
everybody realizes they're out there. Now you're, you're, when you have crowds and demonstrations, we're using it. So people are more accepting of it now, and it's more available. So it's more available for policing as well. So you don't have a scenario in which um, facial recognition cameras are, let's say, set up at a demonstration or set up in a very busy precinct where you know that there are pickpockets or robbers or there are particular individuals that you're looking for. You don't have that sort of use no. of it at the moment? No, I don't. And I know my, my counterparts in, in the UK have that. The UK has a much different history and experience. But it's been uh, very controversial in the UK as well. Yeah, uh, but we have just not been able to do that. Uh, uh, the, the public tolerance for that here would is, is not there for that. So, And we're not moving in that direction uh, uh, at this point in time. One of the other challenges, of course, is the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic. How has Canada managed to deal with the pandemic and the various problems that that has brought? Well, I, I think, you know, throughout the country, uh, we've had different responses throughout the 10 provinces. I think, I think within the province of Ontario, we, where we reside, and particularly in Toronto, I think Toronto in particular has done, has done a good job. Uh, we've had, uh, we developed... Um, you know, under the leadership of our fire chief, who was designated the incident commander. Uh, um, you know, I, I think we've had a, a very good process um, of management group that's involved everybody across the city, all the different entities within the city, a whole of service approach, so that everybody was involved and had input. No one was left out and, and say, marginalized in any way. And, and I think that's created a very effective response. We've had very effective communication to keep the city informed. Um, you know, very robust vaccination efforts and education. Of course, not mandated, but just trying to encourage people for vaccination. And, and I think we're up in excess of 90% uptick in that. So I think we've done, the city has done a very commendable job and, and, uh, in, in addressing that issue. Have you had uh, to fine people huge amounts of money? Because I think the level of fines has been very high, hasn't it? There, there, there has been, but we haven't had a lot of that. There, we, you know, during different lockdown periods that we had, there, there has been some fines that uh, were leveled, but not an extraordinary amount. Uh, we had a great deal of compliance, particularly early on, uh, as you became, as we moved further into the pandemic, there, there was more civil disobedience, if you will. Um, but I think uh, that's, I just think, you know, with the pandemic going on as long as it has, that definitely frustrated some people and, and created a little bit more uh, of that. But we haven't had, it hasn't been a real big problem for us from a policing standpoint. We've had a lot of demonstrations and, and uh, we deal with demonstrations very well in the city of Toronto. Our people do a very, very good job. You know, peaceful protests. We facilitate it. We facilitate marches through the downtown streets, and uh, we have not had a lot of issues. And what do you think about the anti-vax movement? I think you've got some strong views on that. It's it's definitely uh, significant uh, in the country. You've seen it in the, the recent uh, 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 protests in Ottawa, and and. Uh, we certainly have had our protests, and there were attempts to do the same thing in Toronto, post Ottawa. And fortunate, we were fortunate in Toronto to have learned from Ottawa, and and we would facilitate peaceful protests. But peaceful protest doesn't include uh, large vehicles uh, and encamping uh, overnight and and obstructing the streets. And uh, uh, we have by our Queen's Park, uh, Toronto is the capital of Ontario, so the seat of government is, is right in the centre of the city, but also adjacent to that is what we refer to as hospital role with all of the major hospitals in the city. And we were not going to allow that area to be disrupted for patients and staff, and, and so we put a plan in place not to allow that. But um, Can you understand the, the, the anti-vax movement? Um, personally, no, uh, I think there's a lot of misinformation. Uh, you know, social media I think perpetuates some of that. Um, you know, I, I think I'm in a different position. I work very closely with the hospitals and the the CEO of hospitals, and you know, I, I hear the comments from the doctors about everyone that's unvaccinated that comes in, and generally their last words before you know, going on a ventilator is I should have been vaccinated or as soon as they come into the hospital, can I get the vaccination now? So you hear so many of those stories 
and I think that maybe influences me to wonder why. And and of course, you know, it's perhaps a little easier. I I fall into that age category that is perhaps in, in a different. I ha, you know, if I was if I was young, healthy, and thirty, I might have a different attitude. You, as well. You've had COVID, haven't you? Yeah, yeah I did. I, I did it at I did have it at Christmas, but you know, I, I had a mild headache for a couple of days, and uh, I personally attribute that to being vaccinated. So. One of the other issues, I suppose, to come out of the pandemic is the importance of leadership. What, for you, as, as, the, as the Chief of Toronto Police, a man with over 40 years experience of policing, what, are you, what, what would you say are the key characteristics of good and effective leadership? You know, that's, that's a great question, Dan. And I, you know, I, w I was listening to one of the uh, presentations earlier this morning from uh, a chief constable from the UK and, and, and you know we talk about public trust and confidence being so important in policing but I I think you know as a leader you have to inspire not only from your membership but you got to inspire from the community that public trust and confidence so I think you have to present an image that's responsible uh, that's empathetic uh, that is balanced and uh, I, you know, and, and inspires confidence from those that are that are listening to you. And I think, I think uh, for police leaders in uh, in particular, you need to inspire that community confidence. And I think that's very, very important. Um, How do you do that? I mean, it's 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 easy to say, but it's harder to do. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. But I, I think really, from my perspective, it's 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 that it's that interaction with the communities that we have. One of the things I did when I became chief was to reestablish our PACER group and it's a, it's a police account, the acronym is Police Accountability Engagement Review and, um, and it's members of the community and they, they get involved in all aspects of policing. Um, they are really, um, you know, will, whether it's training, how we're doing enforcement, they will engage the officers and they will, the officers will report on how that process is doing, the steps that they're taking, and they will provide inf information, input, counsel. They will actually get involved in helping us formulate policy, formulate training. And I think that ability to listen to those insights, listen to that lived experience, uh, demonstrating a genuine and sincere commitment to that engagement, because it has to be more than just words. They have to actually see it. They have to see that your your commitment is visible, and it's genuine. And I think uh, that's what's very very important in the leadership to engage the communities, and feel that they can participate and contribute. Is that something that can be taught or learned, or is that something that comes from within? Would you say? Um, no, I, I think it's 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 I, I think it's a learned experience. I think if you know if you were to take you know Jim Raymer and you know, 20 or 30 years ago, put them in there. I'm not sure I'd have the same willingness to do that same interaction and recognize, you know what I, you know, we look at how diverse, I, I look at how diverse Dubai is here now. Toronto is a very diverse city as well. And, and really recognizing that lived experience, you know, and that, you know, developing that cultural competence is so important. And so I, I think, yeah, I think it's absolutely something that we can learn. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, my generation in particular has had to learn that. Uh, I think some of the younger generations are growing up uh, and it's embedded in them. Do you think policing's been a bit insular historically? Yes, I do. Uh, very much so. And, uh, but not so, much, not so much anymore. I think uh, we have learned and I think policing in general is, is very good now at at engaging everyone and having having that input What's, from the what, community. What changed it? Do you think the, the murder of George Floyd began to change that, or was it happening before then? What do you think? I, I think I think uh, I think it was happening before that. Uh, I think the murder of George Floyd really shed a spotlight on it, um, and I think it's it's it sped up the process. You know, like I, I'll give you an example. You know, when you look at how we respond to mental health. In Toronto, we developed a program 20 years ago uh, called, uh, the acronym is MCIT, and it's a major crisis intervention team, and it engages a nurse and a police officer to attend a mental health call. Well, you know, the police have been accused of, you know, not wanting to try alternate 
ways of doing business. Well, we were doing it 20 years ago, fully engaged in wanting to do, but we couldn't expand the program because the funding wasn't there. George Floyd happens, and now the funding was there for additional nurses for us to engage in that program. So, yes, with George Floyd, we are doing it better. Uh, we are proceeding quicker in terms of alternate service. But we were always interested, engaged, and wanting to work with the community. So it's, it's definitely, I think, sped up the process. Um, but I, I think the, there was always a willingness by the police to do that. Now, I'd like to turn to drugs policy because I know you've been quite outspoken about where you see the sort of the direction of travel where it should go. Can you outline for us what is the situation in Toronto, indeed in Ontario, regarding uh, drugs and, and, and cannabis? What is the law and what is the direction that you would like to see things moving towards? Well, I mean, we decriminalized marijuana a few years back and... and um, um, for, you know, for all for personal use or for, or for supply for all use yeah for for use all use yes and it's it's worked out it's been it hasn't and, and sorry and for supply or for yeah no you can't uh, it's it's a government supply it's you can't illegally you uh, import marijuana but it's it's regulated supply is 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 legal right mm -hmm. and um, you know there's still i mean it's we still have work to do in that area but it's 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 proceeding I, I think well. I, I mean, when I look back to the enforcement we did 30 and 40 years ago and the criminal records that people received for that use, uh, I, I think it's moving in the right direction. The um, Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police and, and uh, the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police supports decriminalization. Um, but for all drugs? Yes, but, but there's some caveats to that. And so that's really what's happening in, like, for instance, in Toronto right now, the City of Toronto has put an application for it to the federal government to decriminalize drugs in the City of Toronto. And so uh, that's being led by Toronto Public Health. Uh, the police are involved, activists uh, in the community are involved as well. And there's some, we have some very divergent opinions about what that should look like. You know, from a policing perspective, first of all, we need to be involved in the discussion. But I think secondly, there's some key issues that need to be addressed. And one of them is the threshold amount. So, for instance, uh, for those that are addicted to drugs, we support decriminalization because it's a public health issue and we want to help people. But for the drug dealers, we don't support simple possession and decriminalize simple possession. Okay. So, um, and then, and then, and so that's one aspect. So, but then the other thing is we need the government to ensure that there's safe supply, not fentanyl laced drugs. Right, that are killing people in record numbers throughout the country. And, and so you need regulated supply, but also you need wraparound social services to help, which we do not have. Right? So we need that government investment as well to help these individuals. Otherwise, it just becomes a revolving door of, of you know, people that, where we have officers that are reviving people on the street with the lock zone, and they're essentially just getting up and going to continue. And uh, we had one initially, recently where officers rescued someone in the lock zone. For, it probably went on for five or six minutes before the ambulance got there, and the officers helped the individual recover. And when they lifted up his shirt, he had the had just out from receiving hospital treatment. You have to have services that are going to help these people. And, and from a policing standpoint, we'd like to see some mandatory obligations for treatment, right? Uh, somehow embedded into a program. Otherwise, we don't know where the success will be. You'll see in other cities in the country where, you know, it's, it's quite freewheeling, and perhaps not the right word, but, you know, where, where they're, they're, people are just allowed, they have safe zones to do this. And um, we're still seeing escalating numbers of people dying. So if you don't have, to, if you're not able to regulate this in some way, we feel there has to be some parameters in place if it's going to be successful. And that's what we're trying to do. Find what, it's, what precisely that is, but we want to work and have those discussions. And what impact has it had on policing, the decriminalization of cannabis? What, what, what effect has it had from, from, from your knowledge and experience? The, the reality is, and I think contrary to what some people thought, um, it has not been a huge issue for us in policing. 
uh, addressing it. I mean, you know, sure, when you go to major events now, you go to a hockey game or, you know, a basketball game, you're standing outside and people are, you can, uh, the, the smell of marijuana is in the air. But it hasn't, uh, we haven't seen um, a major issue with it. The, um, it has, you know, caused, we have to train officers now for, to detect that, uh, as long with alcohol for impaired driving. And so there's some of those costs and the government has been involved in, in facilitating, you know, to reducing some of those costs and involved in, in incurring some of those costs for that training that we have to do. But it really hasn't been the issue uh, that that uh, a lot of people thought it might be. That's interesting. So you would certainly support sort of going further, but with particular caveats. I suppose one of the issues could be is that people who you arrest as a drug dealer will say, "Well, I'm 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 an addict, so you can't prosecute me." You know, that that could become a defence, I suppose. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, these are the issues we have to prevent again because we know. Organized crime is involved in, in the drug environment. It's, it's about it's a commodity and it's about making money. And so if they can find ways to adapt what they're doing, right, so that they can avoid prosecution, they will. And so that's why we have to proceed cautiously here. The goal to address those that, that, that have a medical issue and, a, and from a public health lens, we want to address it. But we don't want to be facilitating organized crime and perpetuating the use of uh, the, the drug uh, in that fashion, right? Would the James Raymer from 40 years ago on the beat, beat officer, have taken the same approach to drugs, would have had the same views, or were you sort of more traditional in that sense and we've got to arrest them, lock them up, clamp down, war on drugs? Oh yeah, it was a war on drugs. Everybody that we got, they were arrested, they were charged, and you went to court and, and uh, the individual was prosecuted. Yeah, a much different environment in terms of uh, drug. But and it's, you went along with it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the way we were trained. That was the thinking. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I I can tell you quite honestly, I never experimented with drugs of any kind before I, I, I joined the job and, and, and quite frankly haven't since. But that was my lifestyle and that, that was my generation uh, uh, in terms. So I, that was my belief and that's the way we were trained. And that went on for quite some time. This is, you know, when you look at decriminalization and that discussion it's only a very recent phenomenon so uh, and uh, you know quite prior to you know even our decriminalization of marijuana is only very recent. And when did that attitude towards drugs and policing when did that start to change? I, I, I don't know I think it's always a slow evolution in terms of some of these changes and and then there, I think we have to remember too is that you know that old adage the the police are the community the community are the police so we hire from the community so the people we hire are coming in with that you know that that current thinking as well so it's it's not uh, an easy change for them as you know some people you know for some of us in the older generation but i think you know from my perspective even those of us that are older if you're prepared to adapt and and be innovative and move forward um, uh, I, I think it's easy to adopt uh, and move along with some of these things and the transition for me has not been difficult. I think now though, but as we move forward and we talk about decriminalization, it's me is, is getting the different groups and perspectives to work together and realize that you have to have some of these parameters in place. Uh, we won't accept it any other way, we certainly won't agree to it. Uh, and I think our agreement is essential as part of all of this, but we wouldn't agree to uh, just widespread use because I, I, I don't think that's the answer there's because you're never going to eliminate the organized crime perspective that's out of there and, and from my perspective people will die as a result. Do you think the war on drugs, the so-called war on drugs has failed would you say? Well I think I think traditionally speaking uh, uh, we've had you know we've had limited success uh, there but you know what when you think about the amount of money that's made around the world by organized crime that's not subject to taxation, right? That's not subject to uh, providing better services and public health services in cities and you know around the world. Uh, that's what you're trying to ultimately trying to eliminate because you just want to create a safer environment for all. Finally, I want to ask you about trust. This is one of the key issues in the UK at the moment. Trust and confidence in policing has been shaken by uh, a series of events. What advice perhaps would you give as, as a chief of police, someone who's 
steeped in policing give to restoring trust? Well, it, you know, I mean, it's something you can't do overnight. It's And it has to be something that you do and focus on every day. I mean, it's, it's something I tell my members, we have to we have to professionalize relentlessly and uh, because that's so important to I me mean, because, you know, every contact is vital that you have with uh, with individuals in the community and it's that one event can it can have such an impact and it you know it doesn't just impact your organization or your service it impacts policing around the world when you see these events and so uh, it's it's very very important and from my perspective I think you know we have to when we're doing something wrong we have to acknowledge it we have to acknowledge that we can do better not be afraid to say we got it wrong this wasn't the way to deal with it and I think you know in years past we might have been less receptive to that idea and and I think that's something in this day and age we have to make sure that we're acknowledging when we do wrong and that we're gonna get it we're gonna do it better and we're gonna make that we're gonna have a genuine and sincere commitment to get it better and it's like I, I, I said earlier in the confidence it, it can't be mere words it has to be visible action that the community perceives and recognizes because if you do that they'll participate with you to advance uh, and, 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 and further that public trust and confidence. James Raymer, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Talking Crime on Policing TV. Thank you. Thanks for having me.